Good morning and welcome everybody. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Dean's Book Review. Um, I'm really excited about our discussion today. Uh, my pronouns are she and hers and I always like to start off our session um, by acknowledging the Salt Lake uh, City Valley is traditionally indigenous land and it is a location where um, indigenous peoples would oftentimes come together to gather um, and to hold events and ceremonies and so it seems particularly appropriate that we should be here together today uh, to celebrate this event and this book and specifically uh, September is Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month so it's a great way way to end the month with a discussion of a wonderful book, which is Inventing Latinos, um, a new story of American racism. And I, I think some of our panelists today are going to perhaps challenge uh, that title a little bit, but I think it's going to be a really great discussion and I'm excited to get into it. Um, just by way of reminder, so our format is that we're going to allow each of our speakers to present for approximately 10 minutes. And uh, then at the end of that, that should leave us 20 minutes or so um, for questions and answers. Um, so we're hopeful that we can have both some wonderful presentations from our panelists and leave plenty of time for your questions and engagement. Um, I just had a couple of uh, thoughts reading the book, uh, just kind of high level thoughts that I thought I would share. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Sylvia Torty, who's uh, my colleague and Dean at the Honors College. Um, but the book is really interesting because, of course, it examines kind of the history and role of Latinos and Latinx in the United States. And I think she makes some really salient points that uh, were impactful to me. Um, so one of the first points that she makes early in the book is this idea that the concept of Latino or Latinx only makes sense within the United States. Um, that when you leave the United States, that description um, just really seems to lose a lot of its saliency. And that's because the way she defines Latino and Latinx is by defining them as people who have survived two waves of colonization, which I thought was a really interesting way of describing it. So first you had this wave of colonization with the Spanish who came um, to North and um, South and Central America, and of course engaged in colonization um, centuries ago. And then you had the reestablishment of these borders. In fact, her first chapter is titled, We're Here Because You Were There. So who is in the United United States was very much a product of where lines were drawn um, historically. And then, so you have the, the survival of the Spanish colonization, and later you have that overlaid by American colonization and the impacts of American colonization. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting way and, and thought provoking um, of defining Latino and Latinx as people who survived these kind of two waves of colonization. So that really impacted me. Um, another thing that I really found interesting about her book was this idea of role of place. And she talks a lot about the intersection um, with identity and place and how people's identity changes based on um, where they are in the United States, uh, where their families were in the United States, where those lines were drawn. Um, she also distinguishes between um, people who are from South American heritage uh, versus some of the Central American heritage and the role that Spanish influence versus indigenous influence had in the development of those communities and populations. So I thought it was really interesting how how the role of place really still plays a salient role. I think for some of the other groups that we've talked about for these Dean's book reviews, the role of place may have originally played an important role, but you, you don't see that continuing element of place and geography still playing an important role in the discussion. So I thought that was something, um, a point that she really makes that was very interesting. And last but not least, there's this concept of race. Who is Latino, Latina? Who is white? 
white, who is black. Um, the book starts off by talking about the fact that approximately a century ago, we really only had two categories, white and black or white and non-white, um, and how we've developed these other categories over time. And people of Latinx, Latino, Latina heritage at one time may have been seen as white and then were seen as non-white. And so this idea of fluidity of race, which proves this point that the author talks about that race is not real. It is only real because it is in our heads. So it is not in our heads because it's real. It's real because it's in our heads, which I think was a really poignant point um, that she explicitly made. And we oftentimes talk about this perception of race and whether or not race is real. And I think the author does a great job of examining that and showing how race is not real in terms of being present. Rather, it's um, a social um, creation of our own human mind. And so I think she does a great job of making that example. So I really enjoyed uh, the book. We had a chance, the panelists got together yesterday just to prepare for today's panel. They're amazing. So you're going to really enjoy everything they have to share. Um, so with that, I'm not going to take any more time away from them because they are the reason uh, you're here and they are much more engaging. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sylvia Torty, uh, who is Dean of the Honors College. Dean Torty. Thank you, Dean Cronk Warner, um, and thank you to the Law School for hosting these wonderful book discussions. I've had the pleasure of participating as a listener in a number of them. Um, and thank you also for acknowledging the history of the place in which we live. Um, I'm going to start out by introducing myself and by way of that provide context for my comments today. So as Elizabeth said, I'm Sylvia Torti, I'm Dean of the Honors College here at the University of Utah. Um, the Honors College is best thought of as a small liberal arts and sciences college nested within this fabulous research university. And as such, we provide students a, um, both a curriculum that includes depth and breadth of study and a community of engaged and civically minded peers. So we talk a lot in the Honors College about our obligations to put our talents and our energy to use for the greater good. Um, I'm originally from Ohio. My father is Argentine. My mother is first generation American um, with parents from Italy and Greece. Um, most of my family is still in Argentina. My son was born there. I've spent time living there on and off for the last 25 years. So um, Latin American identity and culture, history to some degree have always been part of my life. Um, I was trained as a tropical biologist, um, a little known fact, the University of Utah in the desert here has a world renowned tropical biologist. So I came to Utah to do my PhD and um, conducted some of my research in Central America. And I in initially intended to work in Mexico. So in 1994, at the beginning of my PhD, I went to Chiapas, Mexico, to explore the possibility of a research project. Um, you'll remember 1994 was the beginning of NAFTA, and I arrived on December 31st, 93 to Ocosingo, Chiapas. Um, woke up the next morning and was in the middle of the Zapatista Rebellion, which some of you will remember as well. Um, it was during that experience that I understood for the first time in my life, despite my Latina history and family, um, the complexity and diversity of cultures, languages, and peoples of Latin America and saw really firsthand the economic implications of years of indigenous um, repression and oppression. Um, that led me down a path of historical research, which ultimately resulted in my novel, The Scorpion's Tale, that I wrote after completing my PhD. Um, and why I share this is because I think Laura Gomez beautifully lays out this complexity and diversity, as well as the US involvement, um, control and exploitation of Central America in her chapter, the first chapter, we are here because you were there. Um, and I really like that she's drawing on the work of, you know, other scholars, international scholars, the British scholars that talk about this continuum between colonization and immigration. So there are Indians in Britain because Britain was a colonizer or exploiter of India. And likewise, part of the explanation for Latinos in the US is because the US has been a colonizer or exploiter of Latin America. Um, that first chapter was really um, um, intense. It was an excellent review, I think, of US involvement in Central America. And even though I knew most of this prior to reading the book, I was, am, was shocked and am always shocked over and over 
at the degree to which the US from the 1800s on has imposed itself on Central America, um, the degree to which the US government and corporations have openly engaged in the exploitation of human labor, the extraction of resources, the oppression of people's freedoms by supporting really cruel and violent dictators. It's, it's astounding. Um, and it's all the more extraordinary, I think, to think that while all that was happening here in the US, the country was creating its own myth and narrative around democracy and liberal society and the rights of individuals. Um, so real irony there. Um, she also quotes, and I liked um, the, the, she quotes the British sociologist Robinson, who calls this, this um, transnational economic colonialism. And I think she's also doing a really good job in this chapter of weaving together the threads of racism and capitalism. Um, and I think she's reminding us here at the beginning of her book that the socioeconomic issues are complicated by race and racism is reinforced by historical and contemporary brutal economic systems. Um, so I really appreciated this context for the rest of the chapters, which I know that my colleagues will talk about the, the census, the situation and experience of immigrants today, um, the relationship between racism against African Americans and racism against uh, Latinos. Um, and if we have time, we might touch later on the continuum, if you will, between um, black bodies and white bodies and how individuals who inhabit these bodies all along the color continuum are treated in the US. Um, and then again, how this is um, uh, overdetermined, a term I vaguely remember from a Marxism class in college, but overdetermined with class structure. So this idea that race and class intersect and interact and influence one another. Um, so with that, I will say, uh, I'll just end that in my role as Dean of the Honors College, we're paying a lot of attention to the Latinx population in our recruitment efforts, um, because this population is growing faster than any other group in Utah. Um, and the youth have an enormous amount of energy and potential. Um, they're bicultural, they're multilingual, they're engaged and eager to use their talents, as I said earlier, for the greater good. Um, in my experience, they enrich our campus enormously. And while I'm fully aware of the anti-Latino sentiment and racism in our community and state um, and the challenges we face, I'm also really excited by the prospect that we can and will, um, with the help of these young minds, break down racism and exploitative labor practices. So despite the national rhetoric and violence against Latinos, um, I think there's a lot of positive momentum here that won't be stopped. And, and I'm rather optimistic um, by, by the young folks coming up. So with that, as short comments, I will turn it over to my colleague, Nicole salazar Howe and let her speak. Thank you, Sylvia, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is uh, Nicole salazar Hall. I am an attorney here in town at Parsons, Bailey and Latimer. My background is in uh, Mexican-American ancestry. Part of my family was in New Mexico and uh, Colorado when the borders were drawn. So we, part of my family is of the, we didn't cross the borders, the borders crossed us sort of mentality. Uh, the rest of my family immigrated as refugees during the Mexican-American War and worked as migrant farm workers throughout the Southwest and uh, the West and to Oregon and Colorado, uh, California, Northern California. A lot of my family settled in Utah four generations ago. I, I'm pretty far removed from Mexico. I'm a good four generations in. I think three generations is the closest I'm in on my mother's side. But then on my father's side, there are no generations. We were always here. This was always where we lived. Um, I identify as a Chicana. My father was a Chicano activist in the 70s when he went to the University of Utah, uh, back when it was illegal to be brown just driving around could get you pulled over to be uh, searched and, and questioned. Um, and he, along with many of the other uh, Latinos who happened to be at the university at the time, uh, started a chapter of Mecha. Uh, they worked with the National Coalition of La Raza and were generally activists and good troublemakers, as they would put it. I am now um, somewhat carrying on with, with that tradition in a little more mild of a manner, more integrated. And I, I did find that interesting in the book, the, the privileged Latinos who are um, more institutionalized 
and I did identify quite a bit with that, that I am now on uh, boards and commissions. Um, I'm an attorney. I'm not in a low wage, low earning sort of job. I, I don't live in a, in a very impoverished area. My children go to private schools. So what struck me about this book was, um, yes, the complexity of, of race and what it means to be Latino. And my family is very much um, indigenous and very much European. Um, we actually did do our DNA and found that my mom's side of the family is incredibly indigenous, about half. And my dad's side, even though we're browner, only 38% indigenous. And the rest was uh, Spain, Portugal, North Africa, um, Middle East, those areas. So to, to have that sort of, we have that phenotypical brownness to us. And so the, the idea of race and Latino as a race does ring very true with us. Um, the census is, I think, one of the most interesting um, ideas that I've, I've encountered as, as an attorney and socially. Of course, there's been a lot of talk about the 2020 census and on the Human Rights Commission, there is a lot of discussion about how do we get a complete count. And as a history of the census, it was, it's a, a constitutional provision to count all people residing in the United States for apportionment purposes, to apportion federal funds, federal dollars, and to assign seats to the House of Representatives. The Constitution does not mention whether you are here documented or undocumented, just are you residing in the United States. The three-fifths compromise or three-fifths provision was included in the, the original, um, I believe in the original Constitution, to count slaves so that white southern plantation slave owners could have a greater say in government by having at least three-fifths of each slave counted as a person. Of course, that is no longer the case, but the progression of how we define race in the census um, was particularly, it was, it, it really, I don't want to say flummoxed me, but it was, it was, it was amazing how at first it was white and black. And then in 1850, it was white, black, and mulatto, which is a mix of indigenous and African. Um, then later 1870, black, mulatto were, were there. Chinese was added because of the, um, because of the, I guess, racism against the Chinese workers that were brought in and were working in California. We were not counted as a group until 1870. We were finally included as a, as a, as a group. Well, actually it was 1850 is when we were first counted. 18, 1860 was the first time Indians were counted the native peoples, even though they'd been here far longer than any of us have been. The changing of the terms and the, the types of races that were included in the census has, has been problematic throughout the year. How do you define a race? And the default has always been white and black and the Latinos have always been a buffer between those, those two races. And for many people throughout the years, it has been difficult, how do we define ourselves? I've never marked white on the census. I've never felt white. I've never been treated as white. I've never been black and I've not been treated as black and I would feel it's disingenuous for me to claim that I am black, but I'm not, I'm, I can't claim either of those. Claiming different races, the uh, white, black, and now Indian, Asian on the census doesn't make sense to me either because I'm none of those either. I don't have a claim to a tribe. I can't claim any Indian. I have it ancestrally, but I don't know which tribes. So to, make it that Latino is not a race means that we are necessarily undercounted. We are not completely counted as a people. We cannot, um, the government cannot truly determine how many of us there truly are. Whether that was done on purpose, I think it was. I, I think the, the large numbers of Latinos that were residing in the United States early on in the formation of the United States was, um, was very scary and daunting for the white settlers who believed that this was their destiny to own these lands and to conquer these lands and to govern them. But by 19, in the 1940s, the 30s was the most problematic census, I believe, because we were defined as, as Mexican, as an ethnicity, as a color. And that data was used improperly, despite the, what the federal law says, to forcibly deport hundreds of thousands of Mexicans from California and Texas. 
as a means to keep Texas and California white, keep from Latinos taking over, making it another Mexico as it was before, because this was all, all Mexico up through here. Of course, as Dean Crunk Warner uh, does say that this, these were native lands far before that in Mexico as part of their imperialism claimed them as theirs. But Mexicans as, as a nationality were residing here, in, even in Utah before, far before the United States were here. Which brings us now to the 2020 census. In 20, uh, throughout the, the early 2000s, Latinos have not been claiming white, as I said. For a, a vast majority of them, or a lot, a lot of them, have been claiming other. And that is what I mark on the census too, is other. And then I write in either, depending on how I'm feeling, I think this year I, I marked Chicana as my other. I didn't put Latino, I put Chicana, because that's what I feel I am. So between 1980, 90, 2000, 2010, about 37 to 43% of Latinos marked other, which means this other category is, is going to be pretty large. If that's that many Latinos marking other, what else are they marking? So an, an idea was brought, let's add Middle Eastern, North African, and add Latino as a race, eliminate Hispanic as an ethnicity, and just have Latino as a race. Um, the questions were tested with, with a, a bunch of households, and many of the Latinos marked Latino as a race. And frankly, I would too. If, if Latino was included as a race, I would probably mark it Latino because I'm, again, not white, black, Indian, Asian, um, Native Hawaiian, uh, other Pacific Islander. I'm none of those. And by and large, the Latinos who normally would have marked other marked Latino on that test question and said, yes, this is where I belong. This is what I am. I feel comfortable marking Latino on the census. The recommendation was given to the Census Bureau. Uh, the head of the Census Bureau, Wilbur Ross, sat on it for a good year. And then in 2018 claimed, it's too late. We, we can't include it. We're not going to include Latino or Middle Eastern or North African as a race on this census and rejected it, even though he'd had a year to, to, sit, to really sit on that data. And, and really, the data was by and large saying we need to include these other races as races, not ethnicities, on the census to get a true complete count. So now we have, uh, brings us to the, the, the citizenship question. The Constitution does not require citizens to be recorded. There are many federal agencies, uh, local agencies, who will record how many undocumented individuals are residing in, in their state municipalities uh, just to ensure that those, those people are being served, which makes sense. But the citizenship question was in my mind and in uh, Laura Gomez's mind, more of a way of intimidating Latinos, keep them from completing the census because of that fear of deportation. It was another level of intimidation to prevent Latinos as a group from being completely counted. Their fears of deportation based on their census data are valid given the 1930s forced deportations based on census data. Those names, addresses, and, citizen, and their Latino status were used to deport them. And many of those people were actually Mex were American citizens and here legally. So American citizens were being deported. And truth be told, that was a concern for me too. And if there was a citizenship question, I was just not going to answer it. But how many other Latinos know that they can just refuse to answer that question? If you are um, a new immigrant to the United States. If you're undocumented, you don't know. You live under that constant pale of fear of deportation. You live in the shadows. So while I have the privilege of knowing that I can just refuse to answer and I'm, nothing's gonna happen to me if, if I don't answer, they don't necessarily know that. And it's that fear and, and intimidation that really I think is insidious in, in that citizenship question. Of course, that question was not allowed to be on the ballot and it's since been abandoned. And of course it did not make it to the census this year. Um, and I don't know what will happen with the 2030 census if this um, underlying nationalism sentiment is going to keep moving and keep uh, staying alive and will integrate into the 2030 census. But for now, on the 2020 census, that citizenship question was not there, but it did create a lot of damage. It, it caused a lot of damage in Latinos being counted, um, and they're already a hard to count group anyway. What I, I must say is that these, the, the, the reason to not get a complete count for us is again, yes, apportionment, but also in determining drawing of districts for, for voting. 
And if you have a district that's, that does not have a lot of people in it because they're not responding to the census, then you can say, well, that district just doesn't have as many people. They're, they're, we, we don't have to have as many people represented. Making it so that Latinos are not counted means that we don't have a voice federally. We don't have resources federally. We don't get enough resources to cover what we need. The 2020 census has been difficult because not enough resources have been apportioned to ensure that there is a complete count. Even here in Utah at the very beginning in 2018, the governor was only apportioning $100,000 and to, to get a complete count. Complete count committees were formed throughout uh, Salt Lake County and throughout the state and rural Utah to ensure that they were counted because $100,000 for Utah to be counted is abysmally low. <laughs> we have so many rural communities that are so difficult to reach. There is no way that we would get a complete count for Utah of even the rural whites, let alone the Latinos that live in, um, in the rural areas, in urban areas, in Ogden, Salt Lake, Provo that it would have been impossible. And there's been a lot of groundwork um, by some of these young people who are very energetic to make sure there is a complete count um, taking place. These hard to count communities have been historically undercounted. And I, I'm hopeful, really hopeful that we've done enough to be able to get a complete count of, our, of the, all the hard to count populations, women, children under the age of four, Latinos, new immigrants, if, if we do, if we are able to get a complete count, which I think is a pie in the sky sort of dream, then we could be fully represented. We could get a, a share of federal funds that we should be getting and not be left in the shadows, so to speak. But my hope is that with recent movements in undoing gerrymandering, putting in gerrymandering laws, um, keeping laws like uh, or keeping out questions like a citizenship question and changing the categorization of race to include Latino, Middle Eastern, North African, I think will go a long way in having Latinos feel like they actually belong here. And of course, we do belong here. This is our country. This is our home. But I, I am hopeful that it will really solidify that we are here and we are not going anywhere. We're not going to be cowed or scared into leaving because of course where would I go New Mexico <laughs> go back to Colorado <laughs> it's right next door um, so in closing I, I think this was a very important book and I think the an entire chapter dedicated to the census and in order to be counted to in order to count we must be counted I think was was very necessary. I don't think enough is enough attention is paid to the census and the impact it has on on funding on on people being able to access their resources. It's it's not just a seat in the House of Representatives. It's funding for food banks. It's for hospitals. How many doctors do we we put in an area? Um, how many? How much do we put towards roads? Um, what kind of funds do we put towards education? Do you get um, educate, uh, enough funds to educate 100 children or 300 children? And if any of those numbers are below what they should be, we're in trouble. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that she dedicated a whole entire chapter to the census and to what we should do to increase our count. And I'll turn uh, the time over to my colleague, uh, Dean Reyes Aguilar with the School, Utah School of Law. Thank you, Nicole and uh, Sylvia, and thank you for bringing us uh, together, uh, Dean Kronk Warner. I, um, this is an important and very timely topic, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of this discussion. Uh, my name is Reyes Aguilar. I'm one of uh, the associate deans uh, here. I, I, I'm used to saying here at the College of Law, actually here in my living room. I'm the only associate dean in my living room. Uh, but at the College of Law, I am one of the three associate deans. And my areas of responsibility are uh, admissions, financial aid, and oversight of our, our new Master's of Legal Studies program. A little bit about myself. Um, I am much of what uh, Ms. Gomez wrote about. I, uh, depending on whether you're counting from my maternal or paternal 
uh, ancestry. I'm either a third or fourth generation um, uh, uh, Latino in the U.S., or depending on how you read books like 1990 or uh, 1491 or, or Guns, Germs, and Steel, I've, I've, I'm indigenous. Um, and like Nicole, I did a, a recent ancestry check. And in fact, um, the kind of the pin drop is uh, on a portion of the West Texas border that literally straddles the Mexican River or the, 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 the Rio Grande. And um, I think ancestrally, I could be among the indigenous peoples who through the genocide that occurred as a result of the, the disease and illness that was brought into the Western hemisphere at the time of, of, of uh, contact with Western Europeans, you know, I, I may not necessarily have an existing peoples to point to, but I have a, 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 a DNA path that shows uh, an indigenous status, I think, for my family here. But it also includes uh, Western European, North African, um, in terms of, of, of background, and the Iberian Peninsula. Um, so like the chapter on um, the, the, the uh, idealization of Mestaje, anti-Black and anti-Indian, I, I, my own uh, DNA makeup shows kind of that mix um, that was in some ways taken advantage of by the state uh, in, in enforcing in a racialized state that America is choices to be made either by those who had racism imposed against them in a very negative way or communities needing to choose in terms of mean, maintaining or trying to acquire either economic or political strength, um, positioning themselves in the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy that was uh, developing in the United States. I was born in El Paso, Texas, um, uh, and I was educated at Texas A&M University for my undergraduate degree. And then I went to the law school here at the U. My undergraduate degree included a minor in sociology. Um, and had I discovered it sooner, I probably would have majored in that with an emphasis in demography. So this book was really interesting to me. Um, I feel that, um, the position that, that, that Professor Gomez came from was first acknowledging that America is a racial state, that you know, race was a part of the Constitution in terms of uh, the, the apportionment of value uh, African Americans had in the counting for the census. And it has played that role ever since. And the book, I think, is an attempt to say, where does the Latino community fit in this racialized American community? And how has the history of that community developed? And where, where is it going or what's its potential? And I think um, the goal is to deal with what's becoming an unprecedented demographic shift. That, that, that the, the Latino community, if you look at it as a monolithic community, which I'll readily argue that it isn't, but if you look at it as a very broad community, um, it will be one third of the American population. And when, you know, uh, post 2050 era of the US history uh, or, or the American existence is approached, you know, will be a plurality society. And um, the, the Latino community will, will play a major role in the demographic makeup of that society. So as I looked at this book and I read it, I kind of, uh, after our meeting yesterday, kind of went down and uh, uh, kind of wrote out kind of the things that was touched on, the things that were touched on uh, by Professor Gomez in the book. And, and um, she puts a lot of um, information into 186 pages. And I think she does it in a succinct and successful way, but begs for a, a longer, deeper conversation. But, you know, the things that were touched on as she developed her book were, you know, history, sociology, demographics, political science, anthropology, economics, and human geography. Um, all these things were rolled into both the historical and other elements discussed in the book. In her introduction, uh, Dean Cronk Warner mentioned that one of us was going to uh, argue with the title, and I'm, I'm the one who argue, argues with the title, although um, I, as I thought a little bit about it, I'm, I'm going to come a bit full circle um, in, in recognizing what it says. But the subtitle of the book is A New Story for, of American Racism. And as I was reading through the book, 
Um, and, and all the way up until, you know, the, the, the last section of the conclusion, what kept coming to mind was this was not a new story of American racism. This was a retelling of a history um, that is actually bearing out again today. Um, that uh, one of uh, the things that, uh, or two of the things uh, that really hit me as I read uh, the book in um, the section on violence against Latinos was the retelling of the story as uh, Texas was um, being uh, transformed from a former Mexican territory, uh, roughly half the, 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 the land of, of what was Mexico before the, the Mexican-American War and the, and the portion that was Texas, um, became the Republic of Texas shortly thereafter in order to allow for uh, the Anglo settlers to have more access to land or take over ranches, uh, there was a massacre by uh, the Texas Rangers in, in, a, in a valley, in a, in, a, in a South Texas Valley town called Edinburgh. And uh, the count uh, was up to a thousand of uh, these Mexican Americans uh, were killed. Um, and the Texas Rangers made the argument that these were violent lawless people, but among those killed were a postmaster and a school teacher. Women and children are among those killed. And um, the violence that was wrought on the community was a result of the attempt to acquire land, but also label a community in very broad strokes. And when I wrote the portions of the text where the testimony was given by the Texas Rangers, what kept coming to mind was when Donald Trump announced his presidency. Uh, and identified Mexican Americans as gang members and rapists and and and, and violent members of our community, and um, what was written was that as they testified, um, one of the Texas Rangers said, "As a matter of fact, Mexican Americans were prone to violence and disloyal to the United States." But this was testimony back in 1915. And, and these are the kinds of words and attempts at categorizing and labeling a people that is continuing today. It's, it's, a, it's a resurrection of that argument. And it was even more telling to me that um, a, a Mexican-American state senator at the time um, had actually introduced legislation as a result of this, that um, after an investigation um, showed that this was a reign of terror imposed upon this sanctioned governmental group, the Texas Rangers, um, that he entered legislation seeking to uh, reorganize the Texas Rangers. It sounds a lot like some of the attempts now to unfund the police. Uh, he was successful in that the Texas Rangers were reduced from a force of 1,300 to 100 men. And so um, it's a little disconcerting to see kind of things playing out in, in a way kind of over and over again from the early 20th century to now, you know, almost to, you know, the, the, the year uh, we're, we, we, we're in 2020. Um, similar issues facing the communities as a result of violence by the state uh, targeting uh, in, in, a, in a racist manner uh, minority uh, communities that um, have been identified uh, and, and labeled in ways that make these kinds of actions um, easier, easier to digest, I guess, by the state, which is frightening. Um, so it, it was it was a reading of this that gave me concern in that our, you know, we aren't learning our lessons in history. Um, and and the, the, the fact there was here again, hit upon last night as I was watching the, the debate and how when the opportunity to talk about race and the issues surrounding race in the country um, turned into a discussion about law and order, that somehow if you're going to be talking about race as an issue in the United States, whether you're talking about the Latino community or the African American community, that what needs to be imposed upon those communities is law and order. 
Um, so in coming away from the book, that's what led me to have a, a belief that this was not a new story of American uh, racism, but a continuing and retelling of a past history that is, is bearing out again today. Um, I, I very much value what Nicole brought up in, in her discussion about the census because this is where I kind of come full circle. Uh, while I focused on one thing in the book uh, in these last few minutes, um, the author gives a direction that can be taken in talking about the Latino community and the issues facing the Latino community, especially as it goes to the census. And this is one of those overarching things so that all can be counted. And even though, uh, and here again, um, she was reiterating uh, in the last development of the census form, uh, a common tactic that was employed earlier in trying to undercount or count in certain ways. It was funny, one of, one of the, the statements made by the author was that in choosing the other, that when a person who took the sentence chose other, the enumerators, the supervisors of the enumerators were told to identify them as white. And that, that kind of there again affects kind of how resources are apportioned based on the racial or ethnic makeup of the community. And so in closing, the, the author talks about the things that need to be done in order to have a, a more impactful and rightful place in the governing, the economic power, and the role of, of, of the, the, the Latino community in the development of our country. And she spent a good amount of time in a number of chapters speaking of the buffer that the Latino community played in, in history. Uh, and, and it was at the expense primarily of indigenous and, and black people in America. But I came away with my thought that as she finished the book, there's a unique opportunity being presented as a result of this demographic shift and the various levels of power that are gonna be available to the Latino community or communities of color generally, simply by, by the, the demographic distribution of these communities. Um, but especially for the Latino community, instead of paying a role of a buffer, I see it as playing a binder, that, that the community has an opportunity as the demographic shifts start to occur in our country to actually bring the differences to light and identify the strengths and not just serve as a, a, a demographic buffer between the races, but potentially as among the, the citizens of the U.S., uh, uh, a people that can bind and bring together as part of the discussion that we've been a part of, both healing and uh, a way to ameliorate the situation that we're in and improve the forward going of this, of, of our, not only our own individual communities, but, but the nation because of what the shifts are that we're facing. So I, you know, that's, that's where I came around to full circle on, um, there is a new story of American racism but it's an opportunity for the Latino community to have a much greater role in, in how we're going to impact that. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was an amazing conversation. Um, and so now we're gonna open it up to everyone's questions. So uh, please feel free, there should be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So uh, please go ahead and type in your questions and I will ask those questions of the panelists. But while our participants are taking some time to type in their question, I have a, a question for the panelists. Several of you mentioned in your comments the fact that by 2045, the United States is gonna be a majority non-white country. Um, and I believe that actually by this year, although it goes to Nicole's point about the need for an appropriate census, but by this year, um, the majority of children should already be non-white um, by 2020. So, and one of the largest groups, as many of you have mentioned, is the Latinx population. Um, and I think Sylvia mentioned uh, what the Honors College is doing to outreach. Um, Nicole mentioned the need for um, uh, an adequate census. And of course, Rhea has mentioned um, the impacts to the 
the community. So my question for you is what does that demographic shift mean for um, either institutions like the University of Utah in terms of our ability to be a successful institution moving forward into the future or and or um, the legal profession? What does that mean for the legal profession um, in terms of who the attorneys are, who the clients will be? I would love to get your thoughts on the impact of that 2045 population demographic shift. I'll chime in on that. And the, the impact is actually being felt already locally, as you mentioned. The Salt Lake School District has a plurality population of students now in terms of the public schools. So we're already witnessing both the, the benefits that that student population brings in terms of a, a wider way of, of students and life experiences and contributions, but also uh, the, the need for the, the communities to serve the needs of these students with, with various backgrounds. At the university, in particular at the law school, uh, what we're dealing with in terms of a national pool, it has shifted as it reflects some of the content of this book. Uh, beginning about two years ago, the largest non-white portion of the national applicant pool to law schools was the Latino population. As a, that was a very significant demographic shift. And so um, as we move towards 2045 and we see those numbers growing and, 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 and that, that is, they went from two years ago about a 15% portion of the pool to this last admission cycle, uh, just under 17%. So it's growing um, that there is an opportunity to both develop programming and um, see the benefits that this community can bring in terms of their life experiences and what the discussions in class and, and the development of law can, can, can have in it, but also a recognition that in terms of having a judiciary in particular reflect the community that it serves is playing an even more important role than it ever has. Uh, so um, we don't have this idea of, um, a, you know, going back to what was discussed earlier, uh, you know, a racialized judiciary where the, the way that, that decisions are made and headed down, especially at the appellate court level, don't reflect, those who are writing those decisions don't reflect the community upon which those decisions are impacting. I, I agree with, with what Dean Aguilar has said about that. The uh, law firms in town would be uh, wise to start adapting as well, making their their uh, firms more open and more inclusive. Um, I know a lot of firms are doing that already. Parsons Bailey has uh, started a new um, equity and inclusion committee um, to increase recruiting and to to make the firm more representative of the people who who live in in Salt Lake in Utah. And uh, we have offices in Reno, Nevada, and in um, Montana and Idaho. And to make our are for more representative of the clients that we serve. It, a Latino is not going to feel or may not feel as comfortable going to an all-white firm, but they may feel more comfortable going to a firm that has taken um, inclusion and equity seriously. And I think to be able to keep that level of credibility and keep clientele, I think firms are going to have to adapt and make inclusion and equity a large part of their, of their resources and their attention. Um, as the book says, we're not going anywhere. And I, I agree with, with Dean Aguilar that the number of attorneys who are entering law school who, are, who identify as Latino or uh, Latinx, Chicano, whatever, is only going to grow in the future. Okay, we have a question from um, Professor George Contreras, who's a professor here at the School of Law. Um, professor Contreras says, as several panelists mentioned, there is substantial heterogeneity among the Hispanic population in the United States, ranging from descendants of slaves and indigenous peoples from South America to Spaniards and Latin American descendants of the original conquistadors. Needless to say, there is significant racism within this broad community, in some cases even more acute than the racism exhibited by traditional Caucasian in the United States. What does the author think about racism within the Hispanic community within the United States? She, she certainly mentions it. She, she certainly does discuss uh, some of that. She doesn't go into great uh, depth about it, but it is, it is there. And it, it, it does happen still. It was in the, the author's 
the author argues that this was um, the different sort that different types of Latinos were pitted against each other to create a hierarchy by American colonialism and imperialism as a means of keeping us down. Um, to this day, there is a big difference between whether you're Guatemalan, if you're Salvadoran, if you're Honduran, if you're Mexican. It, it is a huge deal. And, and there are people who, um, I made the mistake when I was 12 of calling an, another Latina Mexican. She said, I'm not Mexican, I'm from Honduras. What are you talking about? And she was very offended. And I learned very early on at the young age of 12, don't do that. <laughs> don't just assume. So that, that racism is still there. But for the author, the argument was that it was created as, as a means of pitting us against each other um, so that we are not united, so that we are, we do think of each other as disparate groups. Um, and it, it does serve to, to keep us as a whole down. I mean, that's very true of um, the Argentine population, right? So Argentina and Uruguay are very um, European, they think, you know, so they very much align with the European cultures and often you know, in my life, I've heard <clears throat> Argentines speaking disparagingly about um, indigenous populations or we're not like the rest of Latin America, we're somehow different, we're somehow, you know, more sophisticated, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's sort of absurd. I, I've heard that more with the older population, my younger younger people, I think in, in Argentina really do identify as, um, as a more of a cohesive, you know, global South, if you will, um, and not so much, but, but it definitely is with in the Hispanic or Latino population, there are layers and layers of, of racism that exists. Um, and I do think that's just a product of the overall racism that we've all been brought up with, that you know, we somehow over, over glorify European culture and to the, to the detriment of everything else. Uh, Professor Cortez, I think that's a great question. Um, the, there's two ways that I can think of that she brings it up. One is a section that she calls colorism, where she articulates very much like within the African American community, the, 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 the hue of literally the skin color of the Latino community within families or among community members plays a role in the hierarchy that has been developed and has resulted in um, racism between and among various elements of the Latino community, whether it be family members, my own family, I remember my grandmother, even though she would refer to it in, in, um, in loving terms, um, would identify us kind of by skin color, being the, you know, uh, La Prieta, the, the darker one, her, her darker granddaughter to, you know, La Guarita, if, she, if, if there was a, 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 a grandchild born with, with lighter colored hair. And, and they were seen as terms of endearment, but no, no less a distinguishing factor. And I would go so far as to say the lighter, the better in, in, in her mind. And so there was a discussion about also how in the chapter called The Elusive Quest for Whiteness, that at the expense of members of our own community, that, that there are those who, in seeking to become a more um, accepted part of the dominant culture, the dominant racist white culture, that uh, the Latino culture was willing to exercise or um, show racist tendencies against members of their own group. And then it really hit when it was against others. And then this, the chapter called uh, Idealized Mestaje and Anti-Black and Anti-Indian Racism that I think as, as Nicole and I alluded to, this, this racial mixing that we've had in our lives um, uh, was taken advantage of in, 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 in politically difficult situations where the person or the family or the community would have to choose if they wanted to be referred to as white. And if so, then that meant by, by virtue of choosing that, they were gonna to have to act in anti-black or anti-indigenous ways. Um, and I think that's one of those long ongoing conversations that still needs to be had because it is present. And I'll, I'll just add, as a citizen of a tribe, this is not a challenge that's unique to the Latinx community. This is something we'll deal with um, in tribal communities as well as, um, you know, who's passing and who's too dark to pass. Um, it's something that uh, we talk about in tribal communities as well. 
All right, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I think we have time for um, one last question, which comes from Marcella. So Marcella says, there are few things more unifying than a common enemy. As the country moves frighteningly close to increased racial violence, will this result in, at least temporarily, greater unity within the Hispanic and Latino communities? You know, I, I think we've, we've, we're already kind of seeing some of that uh, unity and coming together um, of the, the racial other, anyone who is Black, Indigenous, Latino, any, any person of color. I think you're, you're already kind of seeing that. Uh, I've noticed that with the younger generations of, of Latinos, they are more likely to uh, distance themselves from the white and, and more not identify with the Black, but... Um, ally with with black people because really as we have seen the white nationalists don't really see us any differently we're, we're still part of the same pot of deplorables and so we we might as well band together and, and fight it together so i i do think you are going to see more of that i've seen it more with the younger generations they don't really not that they don't care as much they still are very proud of their their origins but they're they're not as willing to separate themselves out like my grandparents were, who were very much, we are Mexican and we are, we are a mestizo, we, we are indigenous, we are not those Venezuelans, we are not those Argentines, we are, this is who we are. I'm not seeing that as much with the younger, the younger generations and I'm hoping that it stays that way really because there's no benefit in, in parsing each other out. Uh, I'm seeing exactly the same thing in the Honors College. We are um, su um, supporting a number of student-led conversations around anti-Blackness and racism. And we put out a call for student guides to them and student hosts. And um, I was really pleased to see that um, we had uh, Latino students step forward. We had Asian American students step forward. We had students from Southeast Asia, um, as well as African American and, and black students and white students too. And so to me, that was really heartening that it wasn't the labor of having these conversations was not just put on or taken up by the African American students themselves, but in fact, these other students really want to engage in these conversations and host them and become allies and understand more deeply. So I'm encouraged. I, um, I thought it was interesting in the book, uh, the portion that you talked about Bill Richardson, um, the former Secretary of State, uh, former governor of New Mexico. And, and I was living in New Mexico, I was in high school at the time he was a state representative. And his observation that his political success was in presenting himself um, as as a member of a of a kind of more monolithic Latino community, even though at the time there were there were differences, everything from those who identified themselves as Chicano to those who identified themselves as Mexican American to those who, who may have identified themselves and preferred the word Hispanic, and um, that actually kind of flipped though in the sense that it also made him more more, more acceptable to non-latino voters that that if, if 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 he could create a perception of the latino community and his being a part of it was kind of um less less heterogeneous and and less um broken up but one group it, it allowed for his success but his his loss, I think, in, the, in one of the gubernatorial candidate in, uh, elections actually occurred as the community started segmenting, it, segmenting itself. And, and this is where I think a more of a conversation, even the conversations about how the community is referring to itself these days. I, I chuckled a little bit in, in that how Nicole referred to herself as a Chicana. I refer to myself as a Chicano, and that would make my dad roll over in his grave. It, you know, it is a politically charged label in his mind. And so how we refer to ourselves and if we're successful as an ethnic group or racial group, however you want to identify it, um, does kind of hinge on the commonalities we find amongst one another, but re recognizing we are still very different uh, from, you know, generations in the U.S. to recent immigrant status to is what uh, the author referred to as, you know, the elite Mexicans. 
Well, that was a fascinating discussion. Um, I really learned a lot. I wish that we could talk all day. I think this topic definitely warrants it, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, I do want to let everybody know that for October, we will be celebrating Disability Awareness Month. And instead of a book, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna watch a movie. Um, specifically, we're gonna watch um, uh, um, uh, Crimp Camp which is on uh, Netflix and talks about a camp of for people with disabilities and kind of follows their future. So we're excited to do something a little bit different and have a movie discussion next month. Um, so please join us in October to uh, celebrate Disability Awareness Month and to watch and talk about Crimp Camp. And again, a big thank you to my panelists. Um, this was just a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. Such a great way to start the day and to end September. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.